founded by the Quakers. Um, I was raised a Quaker in Philadelphia, went to a Quaker college, and uh, it's been a major influence in my life. Um, and uh, it's nice to see that they wandered down here as well. Uh, didn't get chased out of town. Um, what we're gonna talk about is actually somewhat about history. That we are, I, I, I teach at, at, actually not at Georgetown, it's at the other George. It's at George Washington University. Um, and, but it's in DC, it's, it's right in Foggy Bottom. And one of the things I make my students watch, and I realize this make, it makes you sound like a, like a real ogre, is uh, popular movies about urbanism. And the most important popular movie about urbanism by far is Back to the Future. Because it shows you the two ways that I'm gonna to explain to you of how to build a built environment in three different time periods. And it really talks about what we have to learn from the ancients from people 100 years ago about how to build cities because that's what the market's asking for, that's what the market's demanding. And if you don't do it, the market's not coming. I'm also a capitalist, you may not know this, but, but the Quakers started the Industrial Revolution. And um, they, were, they have been phenomenal business people. And it's by listening to the market that they have been great business people. And that's what this is all about listening to market trends and responding and not making excuses, which a lot of people in my business, in the urbanism business, in the real estate business do. So there's only, as I mentioned, two ways of building the built environment. Number one is drivable suburban, and yes, that hyphen is there intentionally. It is a, it is the form by which the much of the suburbs, but even much of the cities, are built, very low density. All the different uses are separate from one another. Retail's over here, for sale housing's here, rental housing's here, offices here, and, and the only way to get between all those uses is by cars and trucks. Perfectly legitimate way, and we in this country invented drivable suburban. It's only been around 100 years. It did not exist. We've been building cities for six, 7,000 years. It's only been the last hundred years that we've had this new way of building. <coughs> the other way is walkable urban. And this is much higher density. It's at least five times more dense, could be 10, 20, 30 times more dense. It, it still includes, by the way, single family housing, but just on tighter lots, townhouses, condos. Um, and it is the way that we've been building for those 6,000 years, except for the last 100 years. So a quick question, how many of you live in a walkable urban place where most of your daily needs can be met on foot? So that's, that's a fair chunk, so about a third of you. And I assume the rest of you are in drivable suburban. What the, what the survey research showed that Sue just mentioned, which was really smart to do, I mean, you've got to constantly ask the market, what does it want? She said about half of you want walkable urban. That's pretty consistent with the rest of the country. And that, but when that's the demand side, on the supply side, if you have 5% of your housing stock that's walkable urban, I'd be surprised. So, you, you can either look at this as a problem, or if you're a capitalist, you look at it as an opportunity. It's called an up demand. And, and the other name for it that you may have tossed around is gentrification. Gentrification is the pin up demand for walkable urbanism. Now, the reason for drivable suburban, the underlying reason, is the economy that it was born in, the industrial age. And the industrial age was driven by that. 45% of all the jobs, directly and indirectly, in this economy was related to the raw material going into, the manufacturing, the sales and servicing, the financing, the building the roads for, the fueling, the insuring of automobiles. That's why China, right now, 
is the world's largest automobile manufacturer. It's part of the growth pattern of an advanced economy, but it's a step along the way. So it only made sense back in the <coughs> mid-century that as you were seeing the USA in your Chevrolet, if you, you gray hairs out there remember that tagline, that you would drive everywhere. Because by driving to go to the grocery store, by driving, taking your kids to drive them to school rather than having them, heaven forbid, walk to school, and to uh, drive to work, you were making yourself wealthy. That was the underlying economic reason for it. So it made absolute economic sense. So for the 6,000 years, including the early 20th century, really up until the uh, Depression, we built walkable urban places. And, but after the war, <coughs> as you probably know, during the 30s and early 40s, we basically shut down the real estate business. And when we came back, we pushed the pendulum all the way over to build this brand new way of building. It was new, it was exciting, we all loved cars. I mean, one of the things about cars, um, you gray hairs, again, think back to the 60s and, uh, uh, and and, and, and your parents may have said to you on a Sunday, it's a beautiful day. Let's go out for a drive. I mean, can you imagine doing that today? The last thing you want to do on a Sunday is go for a drive. Um, but it was a brand new thing. It was exciting. Also, it allowed us to get away from the city. And this country has been a pretty racist country. And it's been a race-driven phenomenon as well. That, that we, it, it allowed us to get away from them. And it was really, it, it, it was white flight. So uh, it's not all positive, let's go enjoy ourselves like we with the beaver. Um, there was also a racial undercome to it. So we know how it laid out on the ground. We started with subdivisions and, and, and we put in freeways. This is outside of, of Philadelphia. And then we added regional malls. We learned how to build regional malls. This is the King of Prussia Mall. When my mother took me to here as a kid, I just thought I had died and gone to heaven. Take a freeway with swooping off and on ramps. I thought maybe someday Philadelphia is going to be like a big city, like Los Angeles. <laughs> and, um, and we moved all of our offices out there. And then we got much better at building freeways. And of course, this is from the king of freeways in this country, Texas. And then we just continue to push the development pattern further and further out. So much so that for every 1% population growth uh, over the last 30, 40 years, or in the late 20th century, for every 1% population growth in a metropolitan area, we were consuming seven, uh, 6 to 8% land. But we had lots of land. We have no shortage of land. We stole this land fair and square. And we use it up and throw it away and keep on moving out. So, back to the future. Really showed how this future was. So now I'm going to have my uh, savior here. I managed to... Um, um, well, you're going to have to uh, push, the, push the button. Um, my tech skills just... Hit a bump. This is 1955 downtown Hill Valley. Now, Hill Valley, uh, so you, let us not, you can hear a little. So, let me just talk about it. This is this downtown, this is downtown that a lot of us grew up in, right? A plaza, retail on the ground floor, residential or office up above, a civic use right there. This is to a certain extent, an idyllic downtown. And this is what most of us baby boomers grew up with. It was really the remnants of the early 20th century. And so this is that walkable urban uh, uh, fabric that the country was just filled with in the early to mid 20th century. Now, fast forward. To, to, yeah, let me see. 
Ah, also, in 1955, um, the, um, the seeds of change had, 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 had already been um, uh, 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 sowed, that this in the movie was the billboard for the subdivision that, uh, that the Marty McFly was, was in fact raised in, was uh, born in. This is the billboard that he pushed his uh, DeLorean uh, behind. So 1985, so fast forward, 1985, which is when the movie came out. Here is downtown Hill Valley, and it's incredibly depressed. X-rated movie theaters, homeless sleeping on the street. Behind this, that bench there is a surface parking lot. That was the plaza that's been paved over to provide parking for the derelict downtown. So then, Here is now 1985, where the center of activity in the town went. And where was it, of course? The regional mall, surrounded by business parks. This is where the economic energy of the town was. Um, so this, this pattern hit Greensboro at the exact same time. Your downtown was quite vibrant in the 50s. By the 70s, it was derelict, and by the 80s, it was completely abandoned. And all the energy had moved out to the malls, had moved out to the business parks. Um, actually, I'm trying to move on to the... Okay. We're going to wait for... There's a couple more in just a few more seconds. So... Move into the 20th century, and what replaces, and it, it doesn't replace, what layers on top of the industrial age is the knowledge economy. Industry doesn't go away. We just got, we just got a lot more productive. So back in 1960, 1970, 30% of us directly worked in factories, 45% indirectly when you look at all the secondary jobs. And today, it's under 9% work in industrial. But it's a very productive 9%. I, when I go into a, a modern factory, I always play the where is Waldo kind of game. Where are the workers? It's hard to find the workers because it's all robotics. And the workers are basically servicing the robots. Um, and the thing about the knowledge economy, which now represents 55% of all jobs, is that a large percentage of what's known as the creative class want to locate in walkable urban places. And if you don't produce, if you don't give the market what it wants, you're not going to get the knowledge economy here. So with the, with the um, layering on top of the knowledge economy, what we're now seeing is that pendulum pushing back, demanding more and more walkable urban places. And we began to see this in the mid-1990s as it began to affect our cities throughout the country. So, actually, this one does go through. The one that does go through. This is now Back to the Future, downtown Hill Valley. In the near distant future, this is in Back to the Future 2. And... Marty McFly comes back to downtown Hill Valley, and it's a fundamentally different place. So the, de the, the, the plaza is no longer a surface parking lot. It's been turned back into a public park. All the buildings have been rehabbed. Some of them have been torn down, and much higher density buildings have been built. And the place is the economic heart of Hill Valley once again. They got everything right except one thing. You can probably guess. The flying cars. They always promise us flying cars. You never get flying cars. Um, and when was that? October 21st, 2015. 
This is written in the mid-1980s. They nailed it. I mean, think about this. those of you that remember the mid-1980s. Our cities were gone. We had thrown them away. And here was a movie that said, in a mere 30 years, they'd be back. And that's a pretty impressive feat of forecasting. So why does this happen? Well, we know who to blame. And most of us in this crowd look like we're a little older, to be generous. Uh, there are not that many <laughs> young people here. So we can really get together. If we know who to blame, it's the damn kids. It's the millennials. <laughs> and one of the reasons that, that, that you can see this is through television, as seen on TV. That think about the TV shows that you all grew up with in the 50s, 60s, and 70s with Leave it to Beaver and Dick Van Dyke and the Brady Bunch. They were all set in the drivable suburbs. Now, this is not a coincidence that this is, in fact, you know, Hollywood does more consumer research than any industry I know. And they're constantly getting feedback through, through, uh, through a Nielsen and, and, and focus groups. Um, and they are basically playing back what our aspirations are. So, now we can do this one. <laughs> so it's hard to do this one. Um, I Love Lucy, January, third week of January, 1957. This is when Lucy's decided she's going to leave Manhattan and go out to the suburbs. Now, I'm going to have to talk you through this. But here is Lucy talking to Ethel about why she wants to move from the city to the suburbs. And it's the classic reasons of clean, fresh air, grow your own food in your backyard, have a little piece of the farm, and it's great for little Ricky. And so she decides to do it, but then she has remorse. Here's buyer's remorse. So she looks over the skyline, which is really the back lot of Universal Studios. <laughs> And this third clip shows, shows Ricky and Lucy in their new suburban house. And they're thrilled to be out there. And this was just so exciting to get away from the grime of the city, to get away from the noise of the city, and get out into the suburbs. Um, the problem was, is that the, the, the next show, the following week, Fred and Ethel came out to visit them. And two weeks after that, Fred and Ethel moved out to the suburbs. That thus starts the, 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 the sprawl and the movement out to the suburbs. The thing that we didn't know in 1957 is that as you build more drivable suburban places, the model is more is less. As you build more, the quality of life goes down. The clean, fresh air and the ease of getting around by car goes away. That next, uh, you know, that next strip mall next to your house, you're not pretty. You're not excited about that being there. In fact, you're so upset about it that you form neighborhood groups. <laughs> the last 30 years, the rise of neighborhood groups and other what we now call place management organizations is the biggest democratic trend in the country right now. 30 years ago, 50 years ago, neighborhoods were not organized. There were PTAs, and there were Boy Scout troops, and Girl Scout troops, and Little Leagues, but we didn't have neighborhood organizations. Today, virtually every neighborhood in the country is organized, and they're organized to stop the next Lucy or Ball from moving out to the next subdivision. Because of that, more is less. It's actually rational. Now, fast forward. And this is the last one. Fast forward to Seinfeld and Friends and Sex in the City and Two Broke Girls. All of them taking place in safe, walkable urban places. So here are these two, you know, early 30s, walking down the street, enjoying their life, postponing childhood, by the way. And it's, it, it, here was Hollywood portraying a new aspirational way to live. 
And our kids bought it, hook, line, and sinker. And I, I was on Long Island speaking of, about a year ago. And Long Island is where the suburbs were invented. And they are passionate about keeping it as a drivable suburban place. And there is a group of people similar to this saying, we've, we've got to urbanize. We can't just have one option. We have to have both options. And, you know, I spoke and a bunch of other people spoke, but the real powerhouse was about 20 uh, young people in their, that were in their 20s that were all raised on Long Island stood up and one after the other 20 times said, if you don't urbanize Long Island, we're out of here. We're bored stiff and we can't get the kind of work that we want. So you either urbanize or we're gone. I might need new batteries. So, other reasons. The baby boomers. We are becoming empty nesters. We are retiring. Not in a, word, a secondary factor. This is not for all of us. But, there, uh, but a number of us will be moving into walkable urban places. And by the way, many of us, both baby boomers and empty, uh, both millennials and baby boomers, want to see that walkable urbanism in the suburbs. It's not just a downtown revival type, type, uh, type of issue. And this is, this is being uh, driven by the uh, baby boomers, that they want to retire where they're living now, close to their friends, close to their clubs, close to where they shop. The other thing is just underlying demographics is that when we baby boomers were growing up, 50% of our uh, of, of the total households had children living in the household. Today, it's 25% of households have school age kids in the household. 75% are singles and couples. Singles and couples are the target market for walkable urban uh, development, which is not to say that, that you can't raise a family. I live near Georgetown, and on Halloween, my wife and I go to Georgetown because they have the best Halloween. Um, you know, all the kids show up there, and the houses are decked out. Uh, there's a lot of kids being raised in places like Georgetown and Lincoln Park and, the, and even downtown New York. But when you look at the future demographics, looking at the increased household growth over the next 20 years, only 14% of household growth will have school-age kids living in them. 86% of the growth in the future are singles and couples. The other thing is sheer boredom. I think this is a much under underappreciated thing that, again, we're a capitalist society. We thrive on having choices. But we've had a public policy in place in this country for 50, 60 years that mandates from on high that you must drive and live in a drivable suburban place. And so much so that we've made it only legal to build that stuff. It is illegal to build walkable urban in 95% of metropolitan America and in this region. It's not legal to build mixed-use walkable urban places from, from a zoning point of view, from a code point of view. And then we massively subsidize drivable suburban to the tone of hundreds of billions of dollars per year of subsidies. So if I were being a cynic, I'd be saying that this is a communist conspiracy of having a top-down social engineering saying, you must live this one way. Now, in, in, in the 70s and 80s, that's what the market wanted. But today, that same mandate, that same public policy, uh, in fact, exists. As I mentioned earlier, the creative class is, is a demanding it. And if you, that if Greensboro wants to grow, you better offer the market both ways they want to live. You got a lot of drivable suburban, you have pent-up demand for walkable urban. And then finally, it's just the sheer expense of maintaining a fleet of cars to participate in society. And by the way, um, 45% of us don't drive. So that 45% of us that don't drive have to be chauffeured or they are not in our society. And then, then we have to have a fleet of cars to participate in society. 
we in real estate thought at first that the car companies were our friends, that they got our market to our homes. We didn't realize that they were eating our lunch, that the number two household expense is, in fact, transportation. If you drop one car out of a household, the, the, the AAA tells us it, it costs $9,200 per year to own, maintain, fuel, insure, park a car. $9,200 per year after tax. If you, trans, you, if, if you translate that into mortgage capacity, it's $150,000 of increased mortgage capacity. So you have a choice. Do I spend that $9,400 per year on a depreciable asset, or do I put it into an appreciable asset? And it's pretty dramatic how we've shifted our spending priorities over these last 30, 40 years. It's, it, right now, we're seeing them shift back. So a lot of research has been done similar to the research that Sue just mentioned that was done by the National Association of Realtors. This is one done by a colleague of mine at, at the University of Michigan. And it came up with the same thing, looking at Atlanta, which is in red, and Boston, which is in blue, sort of the two bookends of, of US metro regions, that roughly 50% of us want to live in walkable urban places, and 50% of us want to live in drivable suburban places. And so it's pretty much split. In Boston, the, the, as far as the total supply of walkable urban places, it's, it's at best 20%. And in Atlanta, like here, at best, it's 5%. So a lot of pent-up demand. And that pent-up demand, by the way, turns up in price premiums, that, that we're seeing walkable urban price premiums throughout this country on a price per square foot basis of anywhere from 40%, and actually this is an old slide, new, new research, that, that the price premiums are, are between 40% on a price per square foot basis of walkable urban versus drivable suburban to 400% price premiums. We're seeing large McMansions they're selling for less than replacement price because nobody wants to buy them. There's just not enough market to buy them. So, but the thing is, is that building this stuff is much different. It's much more difficult. That I liken building drivable suburban to, to uh, racing NASCARs. NASCARs, as you probably know, are engineered to only turn left, which is somewhat ironic given their politics, only turn left <laughs> at 150 miles per hour. And what we need to learn how to do is fly fiber jets, which go straight, turn right, turn left, go up five miles in seconds or crash and burn in seconds while going 600 miles an hour while you're being shot at. A much more complex and risky way of building. Many more moving parts. And I'm, and I'm talking tomorrow to the uh, developers and I'll go into more detail with them about that basically that if you're a really good developer at building subdivisions and strip malls and take that same skill set to build walkable urban, you're going to fail. You're going to fall flat on your face from a construction point of view, from a site acquisition point of view, from a financing point of view, from a marketing point of view, from a management point of view. Everything is different. And, but what happens when you do it right? is that it starts an upward spiral of value creation, where that it's unlike drivable suburban, where more is less. Walkable urban, more is better. That as you add that next apartment building on your block, you have more people on the street, more people going to restaurants, more restaurants open, it's safer, more people watching. Sales go up, property taxes go up, the, the, the uh, city gets wealthier. Now, all that's good news, but there's no such thing as a free lunch. What you end up having is a massive affordable housing problem. And that leads to that a, a need for in walkable urban places is a conscious affordable housing program. So what, what, what we've been doing throughout the country and throughout the world is taking metropolitan land and dividing it into these this four-cell matrix. So I've talked about the, the form 
that land takes. Walk a little urban, drive a little suburban. There's, then there's two economic uses of land. One is local serving. These are bedroom communities. This is where 90% of the square footage is residential. The other is regionally significant. Regionally significant places are like your downtown. It's like your edge cities and business parks. This is where the wealth of the region is created. So you put all the land in the metropolitan area into one of those four cells. What we found as we worked throughout the country is that the drivable suburban land is somewhere between 94 and 96 percent of the total land in the metropolitan area. All, all of which has to be supported by infrastructure. The walkable urban land is between 1 and 5 percent of the total land. That's it. It's not much at all. And what we're seeing throughout the country is those, those markets that are satisfying that market demand, they may have 2.5%, like up in Metro New York, 2.5% of the land in Metro New York is walkable urban. They need to maybe increase it to 3.5%. That's it. It's never going to go over 5. And it'll satisfy the pent-up demand for, for all real estate products for the next two generations. So we're dealing with very small amounts of land. What that means is the infrastructure costs are just de minimis. They're small. Our research shows that walkable urban infrastructure costs between one-tenth and one-twentieth the price of drivable suburban. Between 5% and 10% of of a drivable suburban infrastructure. Very simple to understand here. If there are 16 infrastructure categories, think a sewer line. A sewer line that serves a drivable suburban subdivision where there's one house per acre costs pretty much the same per mile as a sewer line serving a walkable urban place with 40 housing units per acre. That fixed cost is divided by, is, is, is spread over 40 times the number of houses. <coughs> the cost of that infrastructure plummets. One of the great challenges you're going to have here, and there's a website called Strong Towns that really harps on this and really lays out the research. You, you're not going to be able to maintain your distant, drivable suburban infrastructure your sewer lines, your water lines, your roads. You're going to have to abandon them. You won't be able to afford to maintain them. So we need to invest in these walkable urban places if we want our cities to be financially solvent. So here's one example of that. This is Arlington, Virginia. It's a, you know, historically has been a drivable suburban place with a lot of drivable suburban boulevards, just like any place else in the USA. And the picture on, on, on the left is their main drag, Wilson Boulevard, with the, now, at, at that point in, in the 1980s, abandoned Sears store. Sears had just closed. On the left is the Sears store. On, on the right is the garden center. And where the photograph was taken was the, um, was the, car, and the uh, car maintenance and the, and the tire center. So that was gone. Um, this is what stands on that same site today, same perspective. The garden center is now a Whole Foods. That's an Apple store there in that retail mix. And you have housing up above. That what Arlington did is it, it replaced all of its strip retail, all of it, with high density walkable urban places. The total of their commercial districts in, in Arlington County represents 10% of their total land. It's a very high percentage. Um, oh, and, and, and so two blocks north and south of, of, that, of that image on the right, it goes back to single-family homes. Those single-family homes are the most expensive single-family homes in the entire county. Why? Because they can live in suburban splendor and walk to 50 restaurants and the metro station. 
It's the best of both worlds. And that 11% of mine, sorry, not 10%, used to generate 20% of the tax revenue for Arlington County and falling, as that picture on the left shows. Today, it generates 55% of the tax base. And how this is working is that all those folks living in those high-density housing units, singles and couples, they move to Arlington, they pay school taxes, and then they forgot to have kids. <laughs> the tens of thousands of new attached housing units in, in, uh, in Arlington, they, they have a school child generation rate of one eighth that of those single family houses two blocks away. So, so the single family houses are now being subsidized by that mixed use walkable urban uh, development. And by the way, even though they speak 80 different languages, there's a lot of immigrants in Arlington County, a very diverse county. They, again, 80 languages in the public schools. They have among the best public schools in the country. They have a torrent of cash flow coming from this 11% of their land. So I, I, I want to end by showing you some examples. I, I refer to Greensboro as a third tier uh, metro. First tier is New York and San Francisco. Second tier is Washington, Atlanta. Third tier are those between 100,000 and a million in size. And there's, there's 121 of them, and 19 of them have great models of what you could emulate yourself and, and, and that you can follow, and that 20 years ago looked very much like what Greensboro looks like today and looks a whole lot different now. So Ann Arbor, uh, Michigan, where, where I used to teach downtown, it's got a major uh, university, but it's about the size of your two major universities combined, and they're both near downtown. But the University of Michigan, um, they have two different downtowns. It's a very, very exciting, walkable, urban place. The metro area is about 400,000 in size. Um, Lancaster, Pennsylvania, this is where my brother lives. They, they moved their baseball stadium downtown. Um, they have a major arts orientation with the downtown. This metropolitan area is about 500,000 in size. Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, a college town, Lehigh University, they have a downtown that's quite remarkable, and then by the university, which is about a mile <coughs> away, is a separate walkable urban place. Santa Fe, I used to live in Santa Fe, and this is where I raised my kids, and this is an intensely walkable urban place in its downtown. <coughs> Two million uh, visitors per year come to the high Rocky Mountains to have a walkable urban experience. It's a metro area of about 120,000 people. Roanoke, Virginia, just up the road here. You know, 20 years ago, it was a pretty forlorn railroad crossing town. And they have just, it's just a remarkable downtown turnaround. The picture on the upper right is their, is their now 10-year-old art museum, which is referred to the fly nun crashes in downtown Roanoke. <laughs> Charlottesville, uh, of course, and they've got their major school there, but, but, but UVA is not in downtown. The, the downtown itself is a remarkably walkable urban place. They have, this, they, uh, they have this amphitheater that's very active. They've got a big music scene there. Greensville, I'm pretty tired of hearing about Greensville, but um, this is a remarkable town, an incredible uh, worldwide presence with a lot of foreign companies that have located there. And the reason those foreign com companies locate there is because most European companies in particular demand a walkable urban town. And hence, they've come to Greensville as a result. Asheville, you're also tired of hearing about Asheville, I'm sure. Uh, it's a little too hippy dippy for me, <laughs> but it's quite vital and, you know, doing a heck of a job. And then my favorite, Chattanooga. I've been working on downtown Chattanooga for 30 years, and it's, you know, it's, it, it's a Rust Belt town that collapsed, and it's just brought itself up by its bootstraps, and it's, it's embraced its river, 
Um, and it is just remarkable. They have five different walkable urban neighborhoods around downtown. Um, they, and they have a university right tucked up against downtown. Uh, uh, it's the University of uh, Tennessee at Chattanooga. Just a stunning place to see and, and very comparable to you. And the metropolitan area is about 500,000. And Volkswagen moved here. And I, and, and I talked to the senior execs at Volkswagen. Why did they come to Chattanooga? And, and they said, it's got a great downtown. Germany is filled with great downtowns. If we wanted to get any of our executives to move here, we had to have a high quality of life and have the walkable urbanism that they are demanding. So to end, you are going to create more walkable urban places. And what that will do is it will create economic growth, particularly of the knowledge economy. It's going to improve your government fiscal health. And it's going to give options to all of you that don't have that many options today. Thanks. Thank you, Chris. We will have questions. Uh, before let him catch his breath in just a second, when you came in, there was a card. You were given a card and somebody got a pen. We do want your feedback. We do want you to take a look at um, reflect on what this means for Greensboro and give us your feedback that way. And then there's also um, a little business card with our Planet Greensboro information to keep up on activities, talks, reports that are available. That walkable report, that um, community preference survey I talked about is linked there. Our, da our data book and some other things that are available to, if, you, if you're a data geek like me, I'd love to go check that stuff out. Um, and I know a lot of you in this room, so I know you're clot no more than you're not closet data geeks. I know you like that stuff. So, and then on the back of this is also um, a, our outline of our planning process. So we do have a few time for a few questions. So questions for Chris? Yes, sir. Um, almost 20 years ago, Richard Florida came to Greensboro and gave okay. essentially the same talk that you gave this time. And I want to know what's different this time that this time we're actually going to hear what you have to say <laughs> to welcome you here because you don't have you go or do nothing. Um, well, you don't have a whole lot of choice. You see, to be competitive, you know, it's, it, you know, it's the old expression that you're either at the table or you're on the menu. <laughs> <laughs> that Richard, who I've, I've known Rich for years and we do a lot of work together, um, the, he and I 20 years ago saw pretty much the same vision. We saw the same research. Now we have just tons of models. I mean, I just gave you uh, just a glimpse of those models. Um, so, you know, Greensville and Chattanooga and Lancaster and Boise, Idaho. And, I mean, they weren't anything like they are today. So we now have a lot of examples, and you're being lapped, basically. Though, I mean, I must say, I mean, Elm Street, there's a lot of fun stuff there. It's, it's some pretty weird stuff as well, which is good. Um, I love the Civil Rights Museum. I, that was just killer. I'm so glad that you preserved the building and preserved the county. Um, but um, uh, it's not just downtown. It's downtown adjacent places. It's suburban town centers. It's greenfield development. I mean, there's a lot of different ways that walkable urbanism will be expressed in this region. And it's only going to take up, again, 2 3% of your total land. Uh, so the only difference between then and now is we've got great models, and those models are producing great economic growth. So it's kind of grow or stagnant. Yeah, that's a really important question. I wrote a cover story for The Atlantic about eight years ago entitled The Next Slum. And it was addressing that very issue. Um, 
I'm, I'm also a non-resident senior fellow at Brookings, which is a think tank up in Washington, and they've been doing a lot of research about how poverty has shifted to the suburbs. And um, so, and particularly in what we call the non-favored quarter. The favored quarter here is to the northwest. It's where the white upper middle income housing concentration is. Every town of, of the 384 metros in the country, everyone has a favored quarter. And they therefore have, have non-favored quarters. So the slums are emerging in the non-favored quarters. And um, so some of those strip malls and regional malls, you know, one third of all regional malls are gone in the next recession. It's just, I mean, that's easy to see as Macy's and Sears and Penny's are among the walking dead. Um, and they are the anchors of you know, a third of the malls. So they're going to go. Um, some of those will have a great opportunity to regenerate and be part of the suburban, you know, the urbanizing suburbs. So that we have a number of examples of strip malls that have urbanized. There's a great one outside of Washington and up in Montgomery County. Um, that 20-acre strip mall bulldozed and put in a grid of streets. It's now high density, retail on the ground floor, rental apartments, office, hotels up above. It's wildly successful. It only took four years to build out. It's really impressive. Um, and some regional malls that have been bulldozed and a grid of streets put in. So, but that's only going to be a fraction of what's out there. So I don't think I have a lot of answers. Because, you know, when we look at the slums of the 50s, 60s, and 70s, they were concentrated in the cities, higher density, relatively close to jobs, and easy to service from a social service point of view. When you have four to the acre, two to the acre housing that, that were poorly built to begin with, they're not going to last 100 years like, those, like, like, like the housing did back at the turn of the century, of the last century. Um, a lot of those are, are bulldozer bait. So we're, we're seeing emptying out of business parks and the collapse of a lot of strip malls. I'm thinking of roads that are lined with strip malls. Not malls, but they're lined with fast food restaurants. Yep. They're lined right on the road, and our cities are full of those. Right. Do you see those staying? Actually, if in fact there's market demand, and and again, we're only talking about 3 4% of the total land in the metropolitan region. So it's not going to go all over the place. But there, there are strategies for cores, for downtowns, for suburban towns, and there's strategies for corridors. And those strip malls and those fast food joints, they're one property length deep. And then it goes back to some other residential use, generally speaking. And they can be lined with high density apartments, with retail on the ground floor. That's very possible, but don't expect it to save every strip uh, mall and every what are known as uh, 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 car sewers that, that exist out there. It will be 20% will have that kind of conversion take place. How do city leaders Subsidize. And how do you not subsidize? By, by, by assessing impact fees. Okay. So city leaders <clears throat> should assess fees for developers who want to expand out right. and incentivize and offer cheaper options for people who want to develop in. And it's easy to do because of what I touched on as far as the vast difference in cost of the infrastructure for walkable urban versus drivable suburban. That 
that if you just say, look, I'm just going to charge what it costs me to extend the infrastructure out to you. So, you know, that sewer line and that water line and the roads. And I, um, I was involved with an impact study in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And the, the, a marginal single family home out on the fringe um, cost literally 22 times more to provide the infrastructure than an infill unit close to downtown. 22 times more. And so we established districts and each district had a different impact fee based upon the actual cost of extending infrastructure. And um, that puts a real kibosh on that outward expansion. The inside work um, that there could be um, um, property taxes that, you know, very typical is that a 10-year property tax abatement for a conversion of an office space to a apartment and then, or a, to a condo, and, and those condo owners for 10 years aren't paying property taxes. That's a pretty typical way that, that Philadelphia and New York and Washington and other places have done it, so you might want to copy that. One thing to this, this is my chance to plug participation in the comprehensive planning process. That's why we're bringing speakers out. We, this is the education phase of the process to the pieces about strategies or talking about goals and the type of future that we want. Your engagement, your involvement, and we will have a lot of different ways to do it, whether it's online or at public meetings or some other series of different ways because people don't go to public meetings anymore unless they're really mad. And so we, we want you to enjoy this and, and tell us about your dreams for the future of Greensboro. But unless people speak up and it's understood, this is the type of future. And it's a balance point. It's, it's everything is about balance because what you heard Chris say is it's 50% want this and 50% want the traditional way we're developing. So figuring out that balance where and how and what to incent, it's all part of and that's related to the, the, the strategies that come out of the comprehensive plan. So that's my plug to continue to be involved and educated about the process. Basically, make the right thing easy. Dan, he's dying. Um, 50 some thousand students in Greensboro. So if you had an audience with the chancellors and presidents, mm. what would you tell them? Uh, and I assume this is their simple. growth is, is, is also looking for the kind of amenities you're talking about. Exactly. This is a real easy sale, and it's made. Yeah, I mean, it has been made. That the, that the millennials, their customers, and now the next generation have a high demand for walkable urbanism. That when you look at the urban universities that have risen through the ranks of the US news, they've all been walkable urban universities over the last 20, 30 years. And where you rank with the US news is gospel. I mean, it is, they, I mean, all the presidents and all the deans say, oh, we, we don't look at those. Nonsense. They are <laughs> constantly looking at those. Come September, they are, their hands are shaking, waiting for it to come out. Um, so, and this started with the University of uh, Pennsylvania when uh, Judy, Rod uh, uh, Judy Roden was uh, president. And rather, back in the 70s and 80s, Penn basically turned its back on West Philly and West Philly collapsed, and it became, a, it became a fortress, and it was a very dangerous place to go to school. And as a result, Penn's rankings dropped into the top 20. I mean, who would send their 18-year-old daughter to Penn? And in fact, back then, I went to a college outside of Philadelphia, and I, went, and I was taking a class down at Penn, so I, I went to a, a Penn football game, they were, and they were playing uh, Princeton. The Princeton cheer, uh, uh, cheerleaders came to the other side of the field to do a nice little friendly cheer for Penn. The cheer went, fall back, fall back, school. Penn was the fall back school for the Ivy League. It was the doormat of the Ivy League. Today, Penn's six or seven. 
And West Philadelphia is incredibly vital. It's got the highest office rents in the entire state. Um, and it's really hip. And so university presidents get it. NYU, Northeastern, my college now, GW, uh, they understand that, that if they don't make an attractive urban environment, they're not going to get the students that they need, and they're not going to rise in the rents. Back in the purple. Thank you for a small time record. That's been tough over, uh, over the last, you know, and certainly 20 years ago that was tough. But today there's this magic thing called airplanes that you can fly or, or drive to Roanoke and, and, and go to Chattanooga and go to Greensville and, and, and hear and see what's happening. So you can see examples on the ground of your competitors that have in fact created those townhouses and those condos. Um, and, 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 and I know that resistance intimately. I've, I've done 17 projects in my uh, development career. The most recent one is in, a, um, in an urbanizing suburb outside of, of Philadelphia. It was a nine-hole golf course that, that got itself surrounded by freeways and you know, six-lane arterials. And about a half mile from, from the King of Prussia Mall, which is the largest mall on the East Coast. So it's, you know, it's, it's an urbanizing place. We wanted to convert it from a golf course to a mixed-use walkable urban place with the main street, the townhouses. In fact, some of the townhouses we built are, are, are stacked townhouses, two over two, right up to the sidewalk. It took us 11 years to get zoning approval. Two trips to the state Supreme Court ungodly brain damage, <laughs> and millions of dollars. And we planned it as a 14-phase project. In four years, it's done. Because all the competition was knocked out by that torturous project, or uh, a process. We got through. And um, we had the market to ourselves. The checks are rolling in. Uh, but that's not the way it, it should be. There should be a whole lot more product out there. So you've got, you've got lots of models now. And your factoid for the day to take away from this, 53% of the people in Greensboro rent. Wow, 53? Mm -hmm. Wow, that's really hot. We had a high of home ownership in the of 60, 67 percent right before the, the right. fall. And so we are 53 percent. So that's a statistic. Now that's not all apartment complexes. That's all units. But so you're right. Education. How do we talk to people? They are not renters. Are not evil. They're your neighbors. Um, probably don't even realize that's what the, what's going on. But that issue is a very big tackle. So Jeff, um, you mentioned that uh, walkable urbanism is more difficult to build. take the second question first. When I go to Europe and I talk about this stuff, A, I always apologize for why should an American who, who destroyed our cities in, in the late 20th century tell Europeans about urbanism. <laughs> and then I go into my spiel using all of our jargon, like walkable urbanism and transit-oriented development and smart growth and new urbanism. And about five years ago, this Italian in the back of the audience raised his hand, and, and I've become friends with him since, and he said, you Americans, you always have terms for this stuff. This is just what we do. <laughs> um, so uh, we're relearning how to do it. That why it's more difficult 
is all the moving parts and the fact that the moving parts are all being delivered at the same time. So you have retail on the ground floor and you have apartments up above and all the ventilation shafts that you're dealing with penetrating. There was a project I did out in downtown Albuquerque that had a, uh, had, had a Brazilian steakhouse, a 6,000 square foot Brazilian steakhouse with a ginormous grill in the middle going up five levels through office space. And there was a leak, <laughs> and all the smoke was going into the Chamber of Commerce's office space. And, um, I mean, those kind of complexities you don't have if you have these segregated buildings that don't talk to one another. And they don't need to be managed at all. You just have to keep, you know, keep the traffic flowing and make sure you have 25,000 cars per day that can see your apartment or see your strip mall. That's all you care about. The rest doesn't matter. In walkable urban places, and, and this is really, really important, and I didn't really touch on it at all. There's a new concept, there's a, well, I, I talk about neighborhood groups, and it fits with that, known as place management. Place management's the fourth level of governance in our society. We have federal, state, local. It's now place management is that fourth level. Your downtown's being managed, but all walkable urban places need to be managed, and we need to find ways to put a management structure in, uh, in fact, in place to coordinate, to provide a higher level of service. You know, it needs to be cleaner. Festivals need to be run. The parking needs to be managed in a consistent manner. Circulating systems need to be put in. This is a whole new thing that we're inventing. And since I've mentioned Philadelphia before, it's somewhat akin to what Ben Franklin did in the 1740s up in Philadelphia. He invented local government in this country. He had volunteer organizations to build the first library, the first hospital, the first uh, school, um, the first fire department. That became what local governments did. Well, we're in the 1740s as far as place management. And we have lots of great examples of business improvement districts and Main Street organizations and neighborhood groups and community improvement districts. And the village movement, great movement for senior citizens that are providing place management. And it's, it's part of what makes walkable urban places work. And I'm gonna, I, I hate you guys, you guys are gonna kill me, but I'm gonna wrap it up there. But Chris will be around for a few minutes afterwards um, to talk to you 